Okay. So, uh, as I was mentioning, the last part of our devotional brings in Solomon. And we're going to conclude our lesson this morning uh, on Solomon. The lesson will conclude, I should say, on Solomon. So let's open our Bibles, if you don't mind, to Matthew 12. And we'll read 42 and then go to Luke also. But Matthew 12, 42 states, The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now this is a response of Jesus to a, a question put forward to him in verse 38 of certain of the scribes in the Pharisees said, Master, we would see a sign for thee, from thee. And he goes on, and in verse 42 speaks about a greater than Solomon is here with you. And of course, that's Jesus himself. Now let's turn to Luke 11. And uh, verse 31, it's explaining or recording the same incident 31 says again the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of solomon and behold a greater than solomon is here and he says the same thing about jonah too and we'll read about that now. And instead of going to Youth Instructor, an article on the Youth Instructor, we're going to read from a devotional. I'll give you the um, devotional is Lift Him Up. The Son of God came to the world as a restorer. He was the way, the truth, and the life. Every word he uttered was spirit and life. He spoke with authority, conscious of his power to bless humanity and deliver the captives bound by Satan, conscious also that by his presence he could bring to the world fullness of joy. He longed to help every oppressed and suffering member of the human family and show that it was his prerogative to bless, not to condemn. And I just want to stop there for a moment and share. People in my family have been in great turmoil in the last 24 hours, and God could help them if they would only open the windows of their soul to the blessing God wants to give them. But so many people today, most of the world today, wants their own way and shuts those windows of their heart, their mind, their soul to the blessings God wishes to bestow on us. And I'm so thankful that I've learned not to be stubborn in that way, and I believe you have also, because you're here worshiping God this morning. Let's go on in Lift Him Up. It was no robbery for Christ to do the works of God, for this was the purpose he came from heaven to fulfill, and for this the treasures of eternity were at his command. In the disposal of his gifts, he was to know no control. He passed by the self-exalted, the honored, and the rich, and mingled with the poor and oppressed, bringing into their lives a brightness, a hope, and an aspiration that they had never before known. He pronounced a blessing on all who should suffer for his sake, declaring, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Christ distinctly appropriated to himself the right to authority and allegiance. 
Ye call me Master and Lord, he said, and ye say well, for so I am. One is your Master, even Christ. Thus he maintained the dignity that belonged to his name and the authority and power he possessed in heaven. There were occasions when he spoke with the dignity of his own true greatness. He that hath ears to hear, he said, let him hear. In these words, he was only repeating the command of God when from his excellent glory the infinite one had declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Standing amid the frowning Pharisees who sought to make their own importance felt, Christ did not hesitate to compare himself with the most distinguished representative men who had walked the earth and to claim preeminence above them all. Jonah was one of these men held in high estimation by the Jewish nation as Christ called to the minds of his hearers Jonah's message and his instrumentality in saving the people, he said, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Christ knew that the Israelites regarded Solomon as the greatest king that ever wielded a scepter over an earthly kingdom. Yet Christ declared, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And I pray that wherever you're at, in your home, in, with a group of people, um, at the chapel, that you will be cognizant that a greater than any man is here, worshiping, receiving, I should say, our worship, and may it be pure and holy before him, is my prayer. And that is the end of our little devotional, but we're going to talk more about Solomon as we go on. But now, let's, uh, let us, let um, us, well, I want to consider the Sea of Galilee for a minute because that also plays into the life, well, the land of Galilee plays into the life of Solomon. I'm, I want to bring in some of these loose ends and make, try to make a complete picture, a complete brief picture of the life of Solomon. But I know before we go any further in our Sabbath school, I want to um, welcome everyone, all the visitors, all the regular returnees to our Sabbath school. And you know, you will notice that we come from far and near. Uh, we have a number of people right here in West Virginia listening and being part of Sabbath school. But we have people across the oceans in different nations or not across the ocean and still in different nations like Canada. Don't have anyone in Mexico or Central America that I'm aware of, but we need to pray, not for any honor to ourselves, but that others can join us and share in these great truths that hopefully uh, will be meaningful to you. I pray that God will bless each one of you. And before we start, though, and get any further in our Sabbath school, let's start with prayer, shall we? Father, we're very thankful for this morning here in West Virginia uh, and across the United States and Canada. Yes, it's morning, but across the ocean it may not be. But we're thankful we can be here for many countries, many households, and I ask, humbly ask, Father, and plead, not uh, for me, but for each one who's listening, that you will come close to them and that you will sanctify the place where they are worshiping and that our worship will be acceptable to you. That's what we want, Lord. We worship you because you are so worthy. You've saved us 
from all the misery of sin. So bless each one, I ask, and help me as I share too. May I share only truth and make it in a, um, a good, connected way that makes sense, I pray. And bless our loved ones, those who are struggling, those who may be in the valley of decision, those who um, are suffering from illness or from financial strain or whatever it might be, Father, you know each heart. And I ask that you will comfort now each heart, that you will make this time free from all the harassment and um, worries and maladies that have plagued us. Give us freedom and joy in you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, the first thing I want to share with you is a, a little, we could call it a nature nugget, but it's an information nugget, I should say, about the Sea of Galilee. Because that, the land of Galilee, in part, uh, Solomon gave the king of Ty Hiram, the king of Tyre, 20 cities in the land of Galilee, which surround, or at least on the west side at least, um, had uh, the land of Galilee. So let me open up that particular slide presentation. And this isn't the Sea of Galilee, obviously. This is the Konigs Konig Sea. It's um, a beautiful lake in Bavaria, Germany, close to the Austrian border. In the German Alps, they have a long German name that I can't pronounce. But you can see from these two pictures, at least one picture is looking down at this beautiful long lake, but that in the other picture, the mountains, the Alp mountains, come up straight from the side of the sea. And at the very bottom of that bigger picture is, is like an inch of greenery or whatever. But that's the lake. It's a very nice, calm lake. Let's move on. So I was impressed with the beauty of this particular lake. So I want to tell you just a little bit about it. It's Germany's third deepest lake. Eh, you know, it's not as deep as the ocean, 623 feet deep, which is deep enough for me. And the mountains rise up on the side of it, all the way to 8,900 feet. And I know uh, Ira and other people are and other lands are used to meters, and I'm sorry I don't have the meters down for you, but anyway, it's 8,900 feet. They can, they can rise up that high on the sides of this particular lake, and this lake, I put this information in because we're going to compare it with the Sea of Galilee. This lake uh, is at 1,900 feet above sea level. It's a clear lake. It's a beautiful lake. It's a cold lake. People still go swimming in it, but uh, not a lot because it's like 50 degrees or so Fahrenheit. I know that's not, not Celsius. Um, and, and to stay in that very long gets cold, of course. Even dipping in it is cold. But now we want to move to the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called in scriptures. And it has a third name. I wonder if you know what that third name is, but we'll get to it. Nevertheless, here is a view of the, I think, the southern end of this Sea of Galilee. And I'm sorry, we're having a rainstorm here and it's slowing things down. But remember, Jesus was on this lake. The disciples, the apostles, fished on this lake. And we know Jesus was up early, before dawn, often praying, maybe praying through the night. And here is a sunrise on the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. And if you can imagine, no hustle or bustle, no machine. Uh, 
clanging of machinery or cars or whatever, just a peaceful place to be at sunrise. Isn't that beautiful? That could be what it was like, some mornings at least, in Galilee during the time of Christ. Now, in Luke 5, 1, we read, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, i.e. Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. That's also another name for the Sea of Galilee. And in the time of Christ, the Sea of Galilee, or Lake of Gennesaret, bordered on the richest and most populous district of Palestine. Here's a little map. Um, I'm sure you're familiar. Dead Sea in the south, of course, that is a salt water sea. But if you follow the blue line, which is the Jordan River north, you'll come to the Sea of Galilee, a smaller a body of water. But that body of water is fresh water. <clears throat> Pardon me. Going on. Oh, well, let me back up. To the east of these seas um, is the nation today of Jordan, and then north of Jordan is Syria. And so just kind of keep in mind, we've got Israel, Syria, Jordan, all wanting the water, the fresh water from the Sea of Galilee. These nations are very, um, have Water sources are very scarce, and so because it's a dry, arid land, uh, rivers are few and far between, and lakes, there's just the uh, Sea of Galilee. There might be a smaller lake or two, and this will help you understand why wells in biblical times were so important. People fought over wells. Water was scarce, at least it is today. I, I'm assuming the same climate conditions existed back in the times of Jacob and Joseph and Moses, etc. And water was scarce because uh, rainfall was small, uh, a small amount. And so today, what I'm getting at today is the Sea of Galilee is uh, the water, the fresh water is diverted to Israel. Um, some of it goes to Syria. Some of it is diverted by pipeline to Jordan. But they don't get nearly as much as they want. Let's go on. And here's the text, 1 Kings 9.11. Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram... 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And, and here's a, a map I've put to the side of uh, Israel during the time of Christ. And you'll see up to the north is the Sea of Galilee. And around it, at least on the uh, west side, is the land of Galilee. And then if you keep going over to the Mediterranean Sea, you'll reach Tyre. So I'm assuming, even though we talked when about this a few Sabbaths back, that Solomon disobeyed God to give away these lands of Israel. Nevertheless, he did it, and I'm assuming he did it. He chose the land of Galilee because that was close to where Hiram was at Tyre. And, but um, the Bible tells us Hiram was not pleased. It did not please him to receive these um, cities, and we won't go into that because we talked about that before. Going on. Here's another picture of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you can see there's greenery close to the um, edges, you know, of the sea, but behind it is dry, arid, non-productive as far as um, greenery and growth is concerned, land. So this, this sea, this lake of fresh water was very important in Christ's time also um, because things could grow close to it where the water was. And, of course, they had to grow barley and whatever. Oh, let me read what I put on here. 
Sorry, have to go back. Let's. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest fresh water lake on earth. It's not the lowest lake because the Dead Sea is lower um, than uh, sea, lower compared to sea level than the Sea of Galilee, but the Dead Sea is a saltwater sea. And so it's true to say that the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on earth and the second lowest lake on earth after the Dead Sea, which is a saltwater lake. And the Dead Sea is about 700 feet below sea level. Partially, uh, the Sea of Galilee is partially fed by underground springs, but mostly fed by the Jordan River. And the Sea of Galilee is about 141 feet deep. But the water in the Sea of Galilee is monitored daily by the nation of Israel because if it gets too low, then the growth and the... Uh, Plant life and the animal life around the edges would be deprived of this water and die out. And if it get, got to uh, a point, there can it can reach a point of no return. And so they monitor it daily to see how low the water is and then uh, the level is. And then in 2018, they made a plan to pump desalinated water into the lake in an effort to keep the water level up and not plunge down below a point where irreversible ecological damage to the lake might take place. And so there isn't much water to share from this Sea of Galilee with the nations of Syria and Jordan. And remember, on that side of the Jordan River, there's desert land, and it's uh, dry and arid. So, in order to even grow plants and food to live on, things must be irrigated. Here's another picture of the Sea of Galilee. You can see trees growing near the uh, water's edge, but if you look in the distance, it's just um, mountains with not much life on it, uh, greenery on it. The lake supplies approximately 10% of Israel's drinking water. Um, I'm going to keep moving. In 1964, Syria, and I didn't know this fact, attempted construction of a headwater diversion plan. And that's in 1964. That would have blocked the flow of water into the Sea of Galilee, sharply reducing the water flow into the lake. This project and Israel's attempt to block these efforts in 1965 were factors which played into regional tensions culminating in the 1967 Six-Day War. During the war, Israel captured the Golan Heights, which contained some of the sources of water for the Sea of Galilee. And I might be bringing it out later, I can't remember, but... <clears throat> Fresh water is heavier than seawater, and so they, uh, the nation of Israel finds it imperative to keep enough fresh water in the lake, the Sea of Galilee, to prevent <clears throat> saltwater brine from feeding up from the bottom and destroying the fresh water that's in the lake. And so that's one reason why they decided to pump desalinated water into the lake to make sure there was enough weight to hold down <coughs> the brine and salt water sources. I don't know if you find this interesting, but I did. Now here's a view from uh, up high onto the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and you can see that there are green patches of farmland, but that only occurs because of irrigation going on. Jordan is considered one of the ten most water-scarce 
countries in the world. Remember, Jordan is on the east side of the River Jordan. <laughs> Another statistic I read said it is in the top four of uh, water-scarce countries. So, brothers and sisters, you and I, at least here in West Virginia, we have a lot of greenery. It's raining now. We, So far, God has blessed our area with water. And, but some areas don't you think about this the country of Jordan only in my lifetime was able to establish public drinking water for their residents and um, hygiene uh, ways of getting rid of the uh, used toilet water, so to speak. I don't know if they had even toilet water at that time. But those are two necessary things for cleanliness and health is good drinking water and good sanitation. And all, both of those, of course, one, but both of those depend on a source of water. And Jordan has, is a water-scarce nation. So if you have a good source of water, remember to thank God for that. And here's a dam that's been built. Uh, I think this is in Israel, but I can't be sure. I didn't put a caption. <clears throat> but it's one of the few dams to dam up a river in that area. And I put it in to show you how arid the land is around it. This is just a wilderness in the sense, not of a jungle, but in the sense of dry land. Okay, I think that ends our little discussion or a little sharing on the Sea of Galilee because this was part of the nation of Israel when Solomon ruled. Now we're going to go to our next, to our lesson, I believe. Let's see. Yes. And we're going to finish up. Uh, this is part two on Solomon's repentance. <clears throat> Pardon me. Excuse me. And remember, we talked about the book of Ecclesiastes last week. We're not going to go into it this week. Um, but this is the one way or one of the few ways to prove that Solomon repented from his great apostasy. Gradually, he went into apostasy. It didn't happen overnight. But by the end or... Um, by his old age, he was in major apostasy. And so that's one reason I was surprised to learn from Ellen White in our reading in the devotional that the uh, nation of Israel revered Solomon during Christ's time. Be and I can't understand why, in a sense, he was wise. He built the temple. Those two things, yes. But look at all that he did on the negative side, and yet a greater than Solomon was among them, and we pray by his Spirit he's among us today also. Now, to review. His downfall came gradually, 1 Kings 11, 4 states, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. So it sounds like he was okay until he was old. But Alan White makes it clear that his apostasy, and it can be true for us, our backsliding or our um, uh, trying to live in the world and in the sphere of heaven at the same time, uh, we know that this will, if we try to do that and don't give complete surrender to our Lord and Master Jesus and our Heavenly Father, then we will slide slowly but surely into apostasy like Solomon did. Uh, he had taken many foreign wives, the daughter of Pharaoh first, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and allowed them to worship their gods. He built shrines for the sacrifices of his foreign wives, contrary to God's command. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 11, 5 through 8. Well, OK. 
Okay. Hello, brothers and sisters. I hope you can hear me. I have no way. Unless someone presses star six. Could you press star six and let me know if you can hear me, please? Oh, okay. That's great. I can hear you. Thank you very much. You press star six again if you don't mind. Because I've lost internet, we're having kind of a heavy downpour. I cannot get on with either browser that I have. <clears throat> so we'll continue on by phone. I have no control of the slides. So we're just going to talk to each other as if I called you up on the phone. Uh, I hope those in the classroom. I'm sorry? I can advance the slides for you if you just say when to advance. Oh, all right. Thank you. Let me pull up my keynote here. Just give me a moment and find. Now, I'm sorry. Number two right now. We're on two. All right. Thank you very but much. Slide number two is what's showing. Okay. Very good. Yes, he took those wives. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. It's a quotation from Review and Herald, December 28, 1905, paragraph 19. Solomon's alliance with heathen nations was followed by evils which led many of the children of Israel to violate the law of God. Multitudes became contaminated with the principles and practices of the heathen. Polygamy was introduced into Palestine. We read this last week. The pure religious service instituted by God was replaced by idolatry of the darkest hue. Human sacrifices were offered to idols, and the licentious rites practiced by the heathen were countenanced. Um, I kept this slide in for the benefit of any of people this Sabbath that weren't here last Sabbath, because this is so important. Not only did Solomon uh, go against God's commandments, but look at these Results, polygamy came into the nation of Israel because of him. And human sacrifice also came into the nation of Israel, God's people, because of him. Going on to the next slide. Uh, 
1 Kings 11, 11, verses 11 and 12 state, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it, for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Uh, that's what the Lord God said to, or God, I shall, I'll just leave it at that, God, because we know it was Jesus that communicated um, between the Father and sinful man. So this is what Scripture says will happen, that God was going to do to Solomon, but not in his lifetime, for the benefit of David, his um, servant. Now, the prophet Ahijah of Shiloh prophesied that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, would become king over ten of the tribes of the twelve tribes of Israel, and that's in verses 29 to 39. And, you know, I had planned, before we go, I'm going to the next slide, but before I read the next slide, I had planned, and I'm sorry that we haven't done it yet. Let's open to 1 Kings 11, please. And we just want to read how the Bible talks about these last days of Solomon. First Kings 11, we read the first part last week, and we're going to pick up in verse, let me see here. Well, let's just start in 6. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. Verse 12, Notwithstanding in, the day, in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And the Lord, now we're going to find out how God, or what God's going to do in consequence. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and, Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Eden. Then Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, which gave him an house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. <clears throat> now, this is interesting, isn't it? Um, that Pharaoh gave him a house, gave him food, gave him land. Not only that, we'll read on. And Hadad found great favor, this is verse 19, in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife the sister of Tachpanes, the queen. And then we read about um, a son being born. And then in verse 21, And when Hadad heard in Egypt 
that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing, howbeit let me go in any wise. And, and so uh, that ends the little story about Hadad being in Egypt. But the Pharaoh, you know, uh, the SDA Bible commentary brings out that it was the custom in the Mediterranean land to be a good host. And if someone comes to you needy, you provide as much, you know, within your means to uh, meet that need. That's just being a good um, host or hostess. So that may be one reason Pharaoh did this for Hadad, but also <clears throat> there was a political reason for sure. He was um, making um, ties with Hadad, who was a prince of Edom, and even giving his uh, the queen's sister as a wife. So he was playing it politically uh, sharp, but also being... Um, uh, following Mediterranean etiquette as far as um, guests are concerned. But then something else happened, verse 23. And God stirred up another adversary, Reason, the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadezer, king of Zobath. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them at Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. He didn't go to Egypt. He went north to Damascus. Damascus is north of the land of Galilee. And he reigned there. Uh, and he's the first king that we know of in the Bible of Damascus, this um, reason. Okay, R-E-Z-O-N, verse 25. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that Hadid did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. So here's the king of Syria, um, but he lived in Damascus and ruled from Damascus. And so we'll stop there. The next part of this political intrigue is Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But let's read the slide now. That is before slide five. It's taken first from 1 Kings 11 to uh, 11 through 14. Actually, we already read these verses, uh, so we're going on to the next slide, please. Because, remember, in the verses early on that we read, God said he wouldn't rend the kingdom from Solomon in Solomon's day because of the promise he made to his servant David. And that promise is here. I have it in slide 6, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. So let's read that. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed after thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name. He's talking about Solomon. <clears throat> and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, i.e. the men we just read about, for example, in Scripture. And But he goes on to say, but my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And so there's the promise that God made to David, that with Solomon... Uh, if he committed iniquity, he would chastise him, yes. But his mercy wouldn't depart from him. Going on to the next slide. And so we have Hadad, the Edomite. 
Um, Hadad is a common Semitic name. It occurs in the list of Edomite kings of Genesis 36 and is also found as a designation of the Syrian kings such as Ben-Hadad or Hadadezer that we read about in 2 Samuel. Now, going on, Siegfried Horn wrote these comments in the SDA Bible Commentary uh, about Edom. We And I think I shared this with you, but, you know, history is important, and, and the Bible gives us good history. And here we read about a, a valuable, in 1 Kings, when we read about uh, Hadad and Edom, we have a valuable historical note. Siegfried Horn states, David had conquered Edom. I'm going to go quickly through this. I, I believe we went over this last time. But little is known of the campaign, which must have included many interesting details. This account of Solomon's adversities brings to light a story that might not otherwise have been preserved. Evidently, an attempt was made by David to wipe out this hated race to the south. And I'm going to show you a map in just a minute. Edom was to the south of Jerusalem and um, the tribes of, of um, Israel. And, and so we read about that in 1 Kings 11, 15, and 16, where all the men were cut off and destroyed which resulted in certain servants fleeing with the young prince Hadad to Egypt. It is not known who the Egyptian king was that granted asylum for, to Hadad, for this was a period of great uncertainty and unrest in Egypt. But to receive the royal exile was both proper oriental etiquette and excellent politics as in the case of Jeroboam. Upon the death of David, Hadad returned to Edom to be a thorn in the flesh to Solomon. Such records as this throw helpful light upon the international politics of the day. And here's a map on slide 9. You can see in yellow at the bottom of the map the kingdom of Edom. And that's below Judah, of course. And if you follow the... Um, coastline in your mind as it continues to curve you'll get to Egypt not too far away down the coastline and that's where Hadad and his the servants uh, fled here's another map it's harder to read but it does show the coastline and Edom oh you I can't do a finger point to it but Edom is on the right and if you follow westerly, you'll get to Egypt. It's close by. Okay, slide number 11, 4T508. And the rain has let up. If you'll give me just a minute, I'll see if I can make a connection on the website. So just a moment, please. I'm trying. Let's see what happens this time. Okay, looks like I can at least try to get in. And here I am. Here I am. Okay. 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 Okay, I got rid of that. Let me open the camera and the microphone. And we're back, brothers and sisters. I have to do reset all the parameters here. Just a minute.
extravagance which was not conducive to the spirit of self-denial and self-sacrifice. And that, in addition to um, the great apostasy with his wives and building uh, uh, worship places and sacrificing human beings on the altars of these idolatrous so-called gods and polygamy, all of that came in under Solomon. And yet we know that the Jewish people later on in the time of Christ honored Solomon for his wisdom, of course. And But he wasn't wise at, in allowing all this to happen. Wisdom slowly departed from him. and all, But he also built the beautiful temple under the direction of God in his youth when he was more surrendered to following the Lord. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you.